So most food experts are going to tell you that the Spanish make the world's best ham. Jamón Iberico de Pelota. I don't really eat it that much, mostly because it's so expensive. Their jamón is an absolute delicacy. And when it comes down to it, their recipe is taking a special type of pig, matching it with a special type of acorn, and raising it a very special type of way. I really wanted to learn more about this special method of creating a special type of ham, so I figured why not go to Spain to check it all out. So let's cue the travel sequence. So here we are. We're actually in Madrid right now. Um, we just came in yesterday, spent the day in Madrid wandering around exploring the city. And uh, now we're actually getting ready to go out to the hinterlands of Spain here to go check out all of the different uh, farms and see what sort of jamón we can come up with. You know, just even being here in Madrid, which is, you know, just a big Spanish city or relatively big Spanish city, um, I'm impressed with just how much you see ham culture around here. Like as we were walking around yesterday, it's like you couldn't walk a block without stumbling on a ham shop where you have actual pig legs just hanging in the window and everything uh, ready for sale. The diversity of the cuts of meat, the different options that are available, the different levels of even the types of butchers, whether they're like the most basic standard sort of delicatessen style or we even stumbled on this like really trendy high-end type of butchery, all of it just everywhere and it's just kind of cool to see. And while it's nice to be here in the city and see sort of the end product being consumed and consuming the end product ourselves, I really want to head out to the countryside now and see where it all comes from. So the type of landscape I'm wandering around here right now is, uh, it's known as the dehesa. I've talked about the dehesa before because when I think about the types of trees I'm growing at our farm and what I'm trying to do with our permaculture orchard, ultimately my dream is to create a landscape like the one I'm standing in right now. I'm, uh, I'm at a farm as I'm recording this in uh, Salamanca, which is sort of, uh, I guess I call it Northwestern Spain. I got a chance to visit some friends out here and see their pig operation and see what they're doing. And you know, the whole experience for me has been kind of remarkable because when you think about it, right, for hundreds and hundreds of years, maybe even a thousand years, the Spaniards have been raising pork in a very specific way around here. They have been raising pigs in certain specially adapted breeds of pigs in environments like this, where they have access to, uh, let me find one, oak trees, special types of oak trees. These oak trees will produce a special type of acorn, and that special type of acorn becomes the food that feeds these special pigs and fattens them up and makes the ham that's produced from them absolutely delectable. For the Spanish, ham is like this transcendent food. Raising ham in a place like this is so core to their culture. It's so core to everything that they do here in Spain. And it's a very specific system. Like look out there, right? You can see it. There have been these landscapes that have been maintained and they have these oak trees that have been growing and being cared for and tended. I mean, look at this oak right here, right? They've done special pruning to ensure the longevity of a tree like this. So they put a lot of care into their trees and they make sure that they don't get chopped down. And every year, like I think it's from like October to January, these trees produce beautiful acorns that are then used to feed the pigs that they raise here. So it's this system of, of, of different elements within the landscape connecting together to ultimately make a better food product, right? You have a special breed of pig that's raised in a very specific way. You have a special type of tree that's providing nutrients and helping fatten the pigs in a very special way. 
you know, traditionally, right, um, most uh, Homona Berico, which is the, that final high-end product, is being created with uh, uh, the black Iberian pig. Uh, my friends actually here on this farm, they're actually experimenting with uh, crossbreeds. They're uh, black Iberians crossed with uh, Mangalitsa which is, I know, kind of a breed of pig that's actually becoming more and more popular with homesteaders in the United States. And then you, ultimately you have a uh, artisan culture and uh, just sort of a, a culture of appreciation for how you produce these hams and how they cure these hams for like 36 months before it's truly ready to be eaten. It's a remarkable thing. I mean, I know I probably shouldn't be eating as many cured meats as I'm eating right this moment, or at least over the last couple of days. He's got five pounds of undigested red meat in his bowels. But it's been absolute heaven to appreciate the end product. By the way, if you guys are ever curious how to determine if what you're eating is the high-end black label Hamon Umberico, there's a little trick that you can do. What you can do is you can actually take the ham and you can put it between your fingertips and, and sort of rub it back and forth a little bit and let, you know, the, the warmth of your finger and the friction actually start to melt the fat just a little bit. If it's true Hamon and Barico, and if it's, it's really been pork that's been fattened on these acorns, you're gonna actually notice that it starts to turn a little bit translucent. So just for those of you who are wondering out there, how to tell if the food that you're eating is just a bunch of BS or the real deal. When it comes to Hamona Berico, it, there is actually a real way to tell that difference. Even beyond just the incredible food that can be produced at a place like this, there's actually something astounding to me about just the, the serene nature and the beauty of it all. I, f I feel like so at peace in here. <laughs> I might just like hang out underneath one of these trees and take a nap at some point. Um, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> And you know, seeing how all this stuff interconnects, it really does have me thinking about my own farm and what I ultimately want to do with that place and what I'm ultimately trying to promote when it comes to the animals I'm raising and the trees that I'm growing and the ecosystem I'm ultimately trying to create. About three years ago on our farm, I planted roughly 600 trees over a six and a half acre area. And I've been taking care of those trees and watching them grow and they're still several years away from actually producing much. But as I think about the long-term plan of what my farm's gonna be, it's gonna be something like this. I mean, it's gonna be where I have ducks or geese or pigs or cattle or turkeys or other things. And they're gonna be raised in harmony with the landscape that surrounds. I know this is far flung, and I know that this is one of those situations where people will hear the story and say, yeah, would you look at this guy? He's kind of crazy. But being out here today and just exploring a farm like this, it really has me thinking differently about what I ultimately want to do and what kind of farm I want to create and ultimately what type of infrastructure is going to be needed and, and what sort of landscaping and continued work and investment is going to be needed to ultimately realize the long-term dream. I mean, let me just take you through here and you can see this, right? Where you have a mixture of the oak trees and they're not like oak trees like we have in America. I'll flash the name uh, scientifically on the screen so you can see what type of oak they actually are. But they're scattered throughout here. Then you have other shrubbery that's growing throughout here and, and brush. You have grasses mixed in here. You have even like mosses because it gets sort of dark with the shading. But all of this is just sort of integrated and it all works together. You know, on our farm, right, we have uh, about 160 acres of, of land. About, I don't know, a little less than 50 acres of it is pasture. Um, you know, within like about, I said about a six and a half, maybe seven acre area is where I'm trying to grow my trees. The rest is just open grassland. <sighs> Right now I'm sort of thinking and as I'm walking through here and enjoying just the quiet beauty of it all, like what do I want to do? Part of me wants to actually start to go through my forest and thin that and, and create a landscape where you can ultimately have just like this, mature trees mixed with shrubbery, mixed with open space. And maybe that would be a good place to run some pigs through it. I don't know. So yeah, I know this is a little bit dreamy, this is a little bit far flung, this is a little bit out there, but it's just a snapshot into what a world could ultimately look like for our farm 
in you know 20 30 years from now and you know to be at a farm like this in salamanca and to be learning and exploring it's a nice change of pace from the usual farming activity but don't worry guys toby dog will be back real soon <laughs> If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe and I will see you guys over in this next video. Thanks for watching.